All right. Everybody's going to need a Bible this evening. You guys, and you also need a study guide. Has everybody got a study guide? Everybody will get a hold to one. Got a hold of it. Everyone should have access to them. Okay. Whoa. Whoa. Hot mic all of a sudden. Hot, hot mic. All right. So I just came from uh, Awana, and I just told them about St. Patrick. Last week, I would have told you all about St. Patrick, uh, but I do not have the time to take you all through it this evening. Does anybody, by the way, everybody knows that March 17th, every year March 17th is St. Patrick's Day, right? Do you all know that? Yep. Yep. Every year is St. Patrick's Day. It falls on the same day, March 17th. This year it fell on a Wednesday. It's a perfect time. St. Patrick is a fascinating person in history. In fact, uh, Drew, I think there's a a video somewhere that kind of tells the story of St. Patrick. There might be a video somewhere bouncing around that tells you the story of St. Patrick. We'll try to post it again uh, this evening so that you guys can see it. But it's uh, St. Patrick is one of my favorite people in church history. The things that he did and the things that he saw and the things that he was able to uh, accomplish for the Lord, it's a tremendous, amazing story. But I'm not going to get into it tonight, but we will try and post that a little bit later on and get it out there to you so you can see it. Uh, it's a it's it's a fascinating story. You guys will all need Bibles. Okay, so how many of you have ever watched like I know all of you have, I'm sure. But how many of you ever watched Disney movies, like Disney cartoons? Yeah, like like everybody has, okay? Alright, and what is a Disney cartoon's like main push every single time you see a movie? What are you supposed to follow? Oh, follow your heart, right? Follow your heart. By the way, that's not always, in fact, that's maybe not ever great advice to follow your heart because the Bible tells us our heart is deceitful and dishonest and wicked. So we don't really want to follow that. But anyway, growing up, we watched so many Disney movies growing up, and I still watch so many Disney movies with my kids And they're always telling you to follow your heart. They're always telling you to follow the thing that you most desire to do what you want to do. And another thing that was uh, very prevalent in the 80s and in the 90s, there was a sentiment that was this, that you should look out for number one. Have you guys ever heard that statement? Look out for number one. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah. Uh, When If I were to say like the culture does, look out for number one, who would I be saying is number one? If, I was, if I'm saying I need to look out for number one, who am I saying I need to look out for? Yeah, in the context of what the culture puts out there, I should be looking out for myself. Now, what that does, sentiments like follow your heart or look out for number one, what that does is it creates an environment, it creates a culture in which we start to value ourselves and esteem ourselves very highly. If we are to look out for number one, and if we are number one, then who is it whoever comes before us in that scenario? No one. If we're number one, There cannot be someone greater than us. If we are to follow our heart, then is there room for us to follow the leadership of anyone else? Not really. What that does is it creates a very very treacherous environment. Now, why is that treacherous? Why is that environment, why would I say that that is dangerous? Or that that kind of sentimentality, that kind of thought process is a place that we don't want to be? Why am I making those statements? Anybody have a guess? Yeah. 
It means that, well, even if it means, it means that there is no God, but even if there is one, he's not, what were you going to say? Yeah. So it says that there is no God, but even if you say, no, 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 there is a God, then what you're saying there is that, but we're more important than him. Does that make sense? Now, back in the Bible days, there were kings who raised themselves up. And these kings developed these, these personalities and they developed these complexes to where they thought that they really were great and they really were amazing and that they really were powerful. And so many times these kings would stand there and they would declare to their servants, I need you, servants, to build statues that look like me. Now, why would a king say, build a statue that looks like me? Because they want you to recognize their greatness. They want you to see their image. And they want you to marvel at them. And think they are great. Have you guys ever heard of William Randolph Hearst? Have you guys ever heard of him? Maybe kind of sort of. Maybe the name uh, is, is familiar, but you might not know who he is. Does anyone, real quick before, does anyone know who William Randolph Hearst is? William Randolph Hearst was uh, the man, he, he was, uh, he was a, a, a war hero in some respects, but he lived uh, in New York and the 20s, and he made the newspaper that was, at the time, the most influential newspaper in the country. It was known as The World. Now, William Randolph Hearst had a God complex. And what I mean by that is he really did think that he was his own God. And he would go up to people and he would say to people all the time, when I created the world, I had this in mind. Now, he didn't create the world, but he did create the world, the newspaper. He had a God complex. He thought he was this great and powerful man. And he was, for the culture, a great and powerful man. So we don't have kings in our country during this time, but we do have people who have these God complexes just like those kings did back then. But what I fear is that far too often in our lives, in our sphere of influence and in even our group of friends, we honestly do consider ourselves at a plane we don't need to be. Now, last time we were together, which was not last week because there were tornadoes coming and uh, we did not meet, but the week before that, the last time we were together, we talked about the creation of the world. We went through all six days of creation. We covered what God did during those days of creation. And we talked about how God is seen as infinitely powerful. He is seen as infinitely good. And not only is He infinitely good, but when He creates things, it was good. And then when He creates people, it's not just good, but He says it was very good. And so because we have this very good idea from the Bible, because we have that there, is it okay for us to say, well then, maybe we should consider ourselves as number one. Maybe we should follow our hearts. The answer to that is no. And we're going to walk through what does it mean to be created by God and to be a very good creation of God. But what does it mean to be a very good creation that is not God. Does that make sense? That's what we're going to be looking at tonight. So when we come to the Old Testament, there was a Hebrew word, and it's going to be the first point, okay? All right, and the Hebrew word, go ahead and bring it up there so they'll see it, 
is selam, that T is silent, selam, it is a Hebrew word, and it means idol or image of God, all right? Now, Hebrew word selam is where we get the idea of, of an idol, it's where we get the idea of an image of God. Now, the reason I bring that up is to, let me draw your minds back. Remember how I said that all of those kings, they would erect and they would build up these images, these statues of themselves. Remember how they would do that? Well, it's because they would actually call themselves a selim. They believed themselves to be a selim. They believed that they themselves were the very image of God. And so as uh, God, look at me and I am God and I am the very image of God, then I am going to erect statues that look like me so that you can see God, when you look at these statues. And so what they did during that time is they were actually committing a very, very, very heinous and wicked sin. Is there anybody who knows anything? Maybe, is there any place in the Bible that talks about idols or idolatry? Anything like Yeah. The Ten Commandments, as a matter of fact... Why don't we open up to Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. Does anyone want to read that for us? Anyone want to read Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 4? Go for it when you get there. All right? Very good. So, when we read the Ten Commandments, the first two commandments, the first two commandments are about worship and about who your worship should be directed towards. Now, the first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment is you shall have no other idols before me. Sell them. You shall have no other idols before me. All right? Now, I distinguish it this way, and this is not a hard line, okay, but I distinguish it this way. What's the difference between having a God before God, or what's the difference between having an idol before God? What's the distinguisher there? Why say it twice? Have no gods before me, have no idols before me. What's the distinguisher there? You're worshiping something else before God. Yeah, you, we shouldn't put anything before God, but why would he say it twice? Have no gods before me, have no idols before me. Yeah. Yeah, a distinguisher that I make is that when we look at these commandments, have no other gods before me, you can consider it like this. A god would be something that's alive that you put ahead of God. So uh, we know that in the ancient Egypt, what did they worship? Cats. All right, you can see it all over the hieroglyphics. All right, that would be a God that they put before God. If you love your family, if you love your children ahead of God, that would be putting a God before Him. If you love your president above Him, that would be a God. All right, anything living that you put ahead of God is a God that you should not have. Have no gods before me. I got scared there for a second. I felt like I was in the dark. Thank you for bringing it back up. So what would an idol be then? If a god is something that's alive, what would an idol be? An object. An object, something that's not alive, all right, that you put ahead of God. And you can't be dogmatic. You can't put, make that a hard line uh, or a hard uh, and fast rule everywhere you see this. But it works, and we can understand that here. Anything that you put ahead of God that's not alive would be an idol. Y'all are at the perfect age right now where cars are right in that little sweet spot of something that you could really love ahead of the Lord. It's not alive. Money is a big one that goes ahead of that. Um, there are video games or television or phones. Here's a really good, really, really good test to know if maybe you struggle with putting an idol ahead of God. Okay, here's a, here's a really good test. How many of you have read your Bibles today 
I don't, I don't want to see your hands or anything like that, but just think about it. How many of you read your Bibles today? And how many of you have looked at your phone or an electronic today? All right. How many of you spent far more time looking at your phone than your Bible? It, it's, it's perhaps a struggle that we deal with in today's time. Idolatry, selim, is wrong. Having an image of God that we put above God is always a wrong thing. Now, why would that be a big deal to God? Let's think about that for a second. Why would He say, you shall have no gods before me? You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath. You shall not have a selim. You shall not have an image of God that you put ahead of me. Why would that be a big deal? Why would he make such a huge point about that that he brings it up twice? First of all, because he wants you to recognize that he and he alone is to be worshipped and he and he alone is to be praised. But when it gets down to the practical aspect of even in our identity. I think it's because of this. And I think it's, it's an interesting point to say that point number two, God has already made His image bearers. God has already made an image of Himself. Now we've got to be careful in our language a little bit and we've kind of seen why. Because the kings thought they were images of God and they put themselves ahead of God. And William Randolph Hearst considered himself an image of God and put himself ahead of God. So we have to be a little careful with the language. But God has already made His image bearers. And who are His image bearers? Who are they? We are. People are His image bearers. Genesis 1, 26-31, everyone can read along with it on the study guide. It says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our... What? Image. After our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in His own... What? Image. In the what? Image of God. He created them. Male and female, He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that He made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning on the sixth day. God has made His image bearers. But what does that mean to say that we are made in the image of God? Does that mean that we should and we can rightly say, I can put myself as number one. I can put number one first. I can think about number one. I can follow my heart. Does that give us the right? Does that give us the ability to do that and to still follow God? Well, no, it doesn't. What does it mean to be an image bearer? What does it mean to have someone's image? There's a couple of illustrations that might help us get that, okay? If you were to stand in front of a mirror, all right? And if you were to look at the image in that mirror, what are you going to see? Yourself. So, Kaylin, if you look in the mirror, are you going to see Cortland? Aha! Uh -huh. No, I mean, you won't really, will you? All right? 
Logan, it's the same for you. If you look in the mirror, are you going to see Cortland? No, you won't see Cortland. And if you do, you've got some serious issues. Cortland, who do you see when you look in the mirror? <laughs> He's just blank, isn't it? It's just weird. It's just there's nothing there. Everyone else is taking your reflection. When we see a reflection, that's not really us, is it? Like, we don't look in our reflection in the mirror and we don't sit there like, oh man, that, that person in there, he might, he might want to square up. That person in there might want, to, might want to take action against me. It's not a real... It's not really us, but it clearly shows us. Right? So what does it mean to be an image bearer? We reflect the image of God. Another illustration that might help us is this. When we wake up in the morning and when we look up into the sky, we see the clouds and the blue skies and we enjoy the weather outside like we've had today, there is a great big ball of light in the sky and it's known as the what? The sun. The sun. At night... When we walk out there and we can enjoy the night sky and we can see the stars and we can look at the constellations up there, there's another great big ball of light. It is a lesser light, but there is another great big ball of light up there. And what is it? It's the moon. We don't see the sun. Okay, so at night, we don't actually see the sun. At, at night, we see the moon. But does the moon glow all by itself? No, it doesn't glow all by itself. Then where does it get the light? The sun glows all by itself. Where does the moon get its light? The sun. What is the, what is the moon doing? How is the sun giving us light by the moon? It reflects. So we see the light of day, a lesser light in the moon, because the moon reflects the sun. So what does it mean to be an image bearer? An easy way for us to, to, to wrap our minds around it, just for our discussion tonight, it means that we reflect the character and the person of God. It means that when you look at us, we have been uniquely designed to reflect God. Now what does it mean to reflect God? Well, God kind of spells it out. In Genesis 1, 26 uh, through 31, he says that let us make man in our image. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So what does it mean that we reflect God? What does it mean that we are the image of God? It means that God has given us as humans, a very wonderful, a very beautiful responsibility. We have authority over the rest of creation. We can go and we can plant and we can yield fruit. We can go and we can take care of livestock and creatures. We can go and we can name them. Adam named the animals. We can go and we can have dominion. And not only that, God gave a very specific command. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, what does that mean? It means we're to have families. We are to enjoy going to different places. We are to go find different areas that God has created and we are to dwell there. And then we're to have families there and they go off and they fill up the earth. And if you fill up the earth with reflections of God, then what are you filling up the earth with? The image of God. Yeah, if we are told to fill up the earth, if we're told to have dominion and authority over the earth, then we are told to fill the earth, then we're taking that reflection with us. And we're filling up the world with the image of God. So God already has His image bearers, and we are His image bearers. But that doesn't give us the right, it doesn't give us the privilege to start putting ourselves 
ahead of God. The third point that I want to make is because even though we are the image bearers of God, we are not God. Rather, we are made to reflect God. If we are image bearers of God, we are not God. But we are made to reflect God. So, one of the really cool stories in the Bible, and it's a gut punch of a story too, is the story of Job. Someone, would someone volunteer to read Job 38, 1 through 7 for me? All right, go ahead and start flipping to it while I explain what happened to Job. For those of you who don't know what happened to Job, Job was a man uh, who was blessed by God. He had. Um, he had all sorts of livestock. He had all sorts of, of property. He had incredible wealth. He had sons. He had daughters. And Satan hated Job. Hated him. Because he hates God. Because he hates that Job is an image bearer of God. And he hates that this image bearer of God has all of this stuff and all this blessing from God. He hates Job, and he accuses God. He says, God, you've made this image bearer. You've made this guy, and he only loves you because you've given him stuff. Now listen, if you're going, if you're going to accuse God, and if you're going to, if you're going to challenge God, you've, you've got to know, you've got to really believe you're right. Satan has seen it time and time and time and time again that when people get all this stuff, when they get wealth, when they get prominence, man, they tend to make themselves a selim in their own mind. They tend to make themselves high and lofty. And he said, God, this guy doesn't really love you. He loves what you give him. Let me take it all away and he's going to curse you. God says he's not going to curse me. He says, yeah, he will. So God lets him. Satan goes, he attacks, he kills all of his children, he has all of his livestock taken from him, all of his servants killed. The only people he leaves in his life are his wife who starts cursing him and his friends who start accusing him of wickedness and wrongdoing. And at the end, Job sits down and, and he's got so many questions. He's got so many thoughts going through his head. And Job is really close to accusing God as well. Just like just like Satan knew he wanted to. Just like Satan knew he would. Now, he, Job never does. Job never did. He never uttered a single thing against God. So I don't want to make that declaration. But with all these thoughts, with all these questions buzzing through his head, he doesn't know what to think. But he knows that God has answers. And so God in Job chapter 38, shows up in a whirlwind. Do you guys know what a whirlwind is? It's like a tornado. It's like what's kept us out of church last week. And in Job chapter 38, God shows up. And I just want you to, I want you to hear how God treats Job. Now this guy's been through, he's been drug, raked over the coals, okay? And he's, He's at a place where he just he doesn't know what's going on. And when you read it, Job just he doesn't know what's happening. He's frustrated and he's angry and he doesn't get it. His heart's turned from sadness, maybe even to anger, because his friends have been accusing him, his wife has been telling him to curse God and die. And then when he meets God, I want you to hear what God says to him. Go ahead, Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 7. Then the Lord answered Job out of the world and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you can make the to me. Where were you when I had laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what we were basis, in its basis sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sank. 
All right, so I stop you there, not because that's when God stops, because we could really read the next three chapters. And it's, it's God looking at Job and saying, Oh, oh, Job, I'm so sorry. I mean, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who, deserved, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. There's a bit of sarcasm going there. Because you see, the reality is that Job, even though he had been blessed by God, even though he was an image bearer of God, even though he was someone who everywhere he went, he wanted to reflect God rightly, he went through a tough and awful and evil time and he let his mind go to a place that, man, I, was, I, th- I, th- I thought we were good, God. And, and, and I, thought that, I thought that I was in a place that I couldn't be touched like this. And God shows up and God says, you're not me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Where were you when all this happened? You're not God. You reflect God, but you're not God. So why did Job go through all that? Well, because for the rest of all of history, Everybody who knows the story of Job can say what a wonderful, what an amazing, what an incredible God we have who gives, who takes away, and who will not leave any of those who are His. Job's life served as a testimony to everybody else who would ever read the book of Job. And so when Job asked, why am I going through this? God said, you're not me. You might not get this. You're probably not going to get this. Job, you don't get this in your life. Understand I am God and understand I was there at the beginning and I will be there at the end and understand that I will hold all those who belong to me and I will not let them leave and I will not abandon them. So when we look as image bearers, we're not God. We're not to put ourselves in a position where we can accuse God or where we can think of ourselves more highly than God. That's not our point. No, no, we're to reflect God. In the midst of difficulty, in the midst of good, in the midst of, of high times and low times, we're to reflect God. When people look at us, they should see something of the character of God. When They see us. If we call ourselves a Christian, they should see something that testifies to who God is. So why 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 were people made? Why did God make us? Lastly, we are made to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We are made to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Or if your name is John Piper, we are made to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. Which we don't have time to get into. But we are made to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. What does it mean to glorify God? What does it mean? To make Him famous. To glorify God means we make God famous. Just like a mirror makes our actual self famous because it reflects us, we are to make God famous. Just like the moon makes the sun famous because we see the light of the sun reflecting from the moon, we are to make God famous. We are His image. We are His reflection. We are made to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Someone read 1 Corinthians 10.31 for me. Who's got it? All right, go for it. So whether you eat or drink, or whether you do 
do all to glorify God. Whether you eat or drink, or go to glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. How do you eat or drink to the glory of God? How do you sleep for the glory of God? How do you breathe for the glory of God? There are answers to those questions. We don't have time to jump into all of it tonight. There are answers to those questions. And if you are made to glorify God in everything that you do, then you need to be asking yourself that question. How do I glorify God while I'm eating a piece of pizza and practicing my sweet jump shot? How do I glorify God in those things? Because that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're made to do. And in glorifying God and making God famous, even with our breath, even with our eating and drinking, even with our lying down, even with our working, even with our resting, even with our learning, no matter what it is, we're to do it for the glory of God. We're to do it in a way that makes God famous. And our question should always be, how do I make God famous in these things? How do I reflect God? How do I adequately behave as an image bearer of God in all of these things? We are made to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. This is why we were made. We were made to glorify Him. And so when we do what we're made to do, it brings joy. It brings, it drink, brings fulfillment it brings pleasure to who we are. If we do what we're designed to do, it can only, only bring enjoyment. So we are made to glorify God and enjoy Him forever because we are image bearers of Him. We're to reflect who He is. So when you go to school after spring break, when you go home tonight with your families, when you eat a meal together, when you do anything, understand you do it as an image bearer of God. And that makes you a big deal because we're the only images of God that God has made. We don't make ourselves an image. God has made us an image. A quick note here that I don't have time to expound is this. The fact that we are all image bearers of God is the only reason that we can look at each other and say you have value. Right now, everyone's talking about value. Everyone's talking about how this person or this type of person is valued over this type of person or this type of person's um, triumphs or this type of person's struggles is greater or of more value than this person or this person over here has more value in this area than this person over here and we're trying so hard to talk about the value of people right now and we identify it by uh, social status we identify it by race we identify it by gender we identify it by all these other markers but understand guys that the only thing that makes it makes it able for me to look at, at Ava or to look at Logan or to look at Pastor Drew or any of you. The only thing that makes you of value that I can look at and say, yes, you are absolutely 100% of ultimate value is because you bear the image of God. And because you have a unique task in a unique way that only you as an image bearer can do, only you can reflect the image of God. And those things, that truth, that reality puts us in a position where we can look at all of the world and we can say to people in the world, you are valued, you are wonderful, you are amazing because you're made in the image of God and you're to reflect God. And ultimately, you can only reflect God if God has taken you from your sinful condition, if God has made you alive with Him, 
and if God has given you life to live for Him. And so, as an image bearer of God, let me tell you about the God, the Christ, who you're meant to reflect. Let me tell you about this Jesus who deserves to be esteemed and greatly valued. So image bearers, reflections of God, consider when you leave here, how do I glorify God in all things? And how do I look at fellow image bearers who don't know God? And how do I talk with them? How do I talk with image bearers who do know God? And how do we together look to fill the earth with the reflections of who He is and His character? Let me pray for us. Our band is going to come up and play and we'll be dismissed. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do love You and we praise You and I thank You so much for Your Word. I thank You for this reality and this truth that we are made in Your image. And I pray, God, that You would use tonight's lesson to help us see us in the light that You see us. You have made us Your image bearers. You've created us for that purpose to glorify You. And Father, I ask that as we consider that truth and that reality, that it would encourage us to ask questions about how do I glorify You? And even the small and simple things. And how do I glorify You as I look at other image bearers? And as I see the reflection of Your character in them, how do I look at them and how do I treat them? How do I talk to them? How do I tell them about You? How do I reflect You? Lord, I pray that You would that You would use Your Word, that You would use this truth to make us reflect Your Son all the more. That You would make us more like Him. A closer, a more distinct reflection of His character. And it's in His name we ask these things and for His sake. Amen.